Hey, I'm Tom Ray from Lorenzo's Music, and I am starting up our interview podcast again. We started an interview podcast a few years back, and I was actually only talking with mostly musicians that live in my area, where we're from, uh, from Madison, Wisconsin. But I've been doing a music podcast on our, uh, an exclusive music podcast that's only on Spotify and YouTube, where I can play. Uh, different musicians and not get dinged for it. Basically, it was mostly on Spotify. They allow us to play music on our podcast through Spotify and you can hear it if you have a subscription, but I didn't like that. That was the only way you could do it. So I had created a YouTube version. I figured out a way to do it where I record segments and then put them in a playlist in between different songs that it cycles through. So you listen to the playlist and it's just like listening to the show. Anyway, that's not what I'm here to talk about because uh, what really happened was is some of the artists that I was playing, I'm like, I'd like to meet some of these artists that I'm playing on the show. So I started reaching out to them and that's what this podcast is. This podcast is me talking to different musicians, us just hanging out and going, you know, what's the process like? How do you promote yourself? Uh, how do you create music? And tell me about the music. I want to learn about more musicians, more music, and just kind of meet more artists out in the world. And that's what this is. And my first one today is with a musician that performs under the name Yay Big. So let's start the show right now. My name is Stefan Robinson. I make music as Yay Big. And among other things, I'm also in a band called Nonlinear Field. And... Um, uh, I'm a high school sociology and history teacher. That's how I make money. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> so, um, wait, you don't uh, make money through music? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, I have a partner and a ten-year-old son, and I love to read. And uh, I have a collection of self-grown and cultivated bonsai trees. Whoa! Yeah. No yeah. kidding. <laughs> when did you start doing that? um five years ago maybe four four or five years ago so it hasn't been that long but it's no, i really still, i mean five years is still pretty long i mean you're tending trees. trees yeah 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 what? well it's a really long-term artistic hobby <laughs> okay now, like, now much yeah. like everybody else out there our knowledge of bonsai trees are from karate kid so right. what does what does this involve uh, i mean what are you doing to take care of these I mean, any tree can be a bonsai tree. It's like you're just you're just um, cultivating, growing, and shaping them uh, to to basically. Well, the term just means tree in a pot. Basically, that's what it translates. Really? To. Yeah. Huh. Okay. There's nothing really special about it. Um, and people sometimes people talk about like I bought bonsai seeds from a whatever, but like those are those are just seeds. There's no such thing as a bonsai seed. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, I usually get, I usually find plants, you know, I found like a, um, a cypress off, uh, just growing off the side of, of, of Route 66 on my way to work one day, central Illinois, and uh, went back a week later and dug it up. And I've been, I've been like shaping that tree for three or four years now. Okay. Um, get some like throwaway. I have a Japanese maple that I'm regrowing the, the limbs on right now that I got from Lowe's that was like half dead at the end of their season. And I talked them down to like $20. They were trying to get like $80 for it or something. I was like, this tree is dead. Yeah. Nobody's going to buy it. So I was like, I'll and give you like, Well, you want it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I kind of rescued that tree and I'm regrowing the branches now. That's been, I'm working on that tree for a couple years now, but. Wow. Yeah. What, what made you start doing that? I'm, I know we're going to talk about music, but this is fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's all connected. My, my, the way I approach music is very similar. Okay. Um, all right. I'm a Buddhist and I got into, um, well, you know, among many things, I wouldn't say I am a Buddha. I'm a lot of things. One of the things I happen to be is a, is a Buddhist. And, um, I, uh, got into Kari Sansui, rock gardening i have i built like a dry rock garden in my backyard okay so, you know the gardens with the rakes that you make the shape you make oh, yeah. the circle okay yeah i did that to do as a meditative practice and then i planted a juniper shrub in the rock garden and i realized i didn't i didn't um 
want it there. And I thought, oh, actually, I should dig that up and turn it into a bonsai tree. So I did that. That was probably that was what got me started like five years ago. Okay. And um, I just totally fell in love with with it. I got into this um, this YouTube channel, uh, Peter Chan. He has this bonsai shop in the UK somewhere. And um, he does it. He does it in a way that's accessible to to lay people. It's not for people who are like trained to to cultivate bonsai trees. Right. And so, his approach is real, like down to earth. Like anybody can do this. It doesn't need to be expensive. And um, it's just I don't know. It's just really fun. And I like the idea of of working with life in an artistic way over over long stretches of time. And um, both musically and with trees and with my Buddhist practice that sort of comes together in a way that is very meaningful to me. Okay. I don't, yeah. All right. <laughs> I don't know what else to talk about. <laughs> okay. No. And as, as a musician, like what do you do musically? What do you play? What, what part of the music that I've heard of yours? I mean, what, are, what do you do in that? Well, I don't know. I don't. I know you've heard my project with Scott Mattingly. I mm -hmm. think we talked about um, which. Yeah, uh, the uh, the uh, process of or what was it? The continuation of movement was the song that that I. That's how yeah. I learned about you. Yeah. Um, and FPE Records put that out a while back. Um, I, I don't remember what all I'm playing on that record, but I play a lot of instruments, like okay. conventional instruments. Um, woodwinds, strings, percussion. That's mainly what I play, woodwind, strings, and percussion. But um, I also used to be in a touring hip-hop duo. You know, um, when Yay Big first started as a project, I was producing, for lack of a better word, sort of like uh, experimental hip-hop. And um, yeah. and then I met, a, 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 you know, he's like my brother now, you know, over all these years, um, Moses Harris, um, Kid Static, it was is his hip hop name, rapper name, artist name. I met him in Chicago, and we started working together, and we toured together for a few years and put out a few records. We're, we're actually working on a new record right now, which we haven't done in a long time. But that's so the one Big, that's coming out in twenty twenty four. No, it's not done yet. There's, um, I have a record coming out with John Mueller in okay, January. Okay, that's the one I saw. Okay, yeah. There's nothing hip hop about that record. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, I started working with Kid Static. It was Yay Big and Kid Static, and um, and that was amazing. But I got burned out with the business stuff. I don't like. Um, I mean, I'm blunt about it. I guess I don't appreciate the business. I don't like capitalism. I think we should move beyond that. Um, I don't like commodifying myself. I don't like having to play the promotion game. I like talking with people like you. You know, you're super cool and it's fun. But That's I don't like having to think about business or making money, it yeah. like ruined it for me. That's so I told Kid Static years ago, I think I'm gonna go back to college and get a teaching degree. And he was just kind of like, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> Cause we were, we were on the verge of, I don't know, like we were getting press and we played at Pitchfork Fest and- Oh, nice. Um, yeah, with our friends, the Meishi. Like they didn't book us, they booked our friends and then we played with our friends. So it wasn't, you know, it's not like we okay, were okay. So you were like on a coattails opening. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah we were nothing coattails. wrong with that. I'd take it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but on our last tour, it was a three week tour, about give or take. I made more money on the road for the first time than I made at my day job in Chicago at that time, and um, so we were on the verge of if we buckled down and really, really grind, you know, we and toured for months, we could have, we probably could have made a living. Um, but that was at the exact same time I was getting burned out of trying to trying to do that. And I just want to make art. I don't really want to have to think about making a living. So, yeah, so I went into I went back to school and got a second bachelor's degree to teach social studies. And um, uh, I find that work very meaningful as well. Okay. But um, so that's how Yay Big started. And then I've always played a lot of instruments. And um, it wasn't until after I had moved out of Chicago and started focusing more on like quote unquote solo yay big projects again, that I started to reincorporate live instrumentation. Cause I was doing all my production like in the laptop. Oh, you were. Doing... Yeah. All okay. the yay big kinetic stuff is like kind of glitchy electronic 
mm -hmm. um, sample based stuff. The new Yay Big Kid Static album that is only about halfway done is one long piece and it's all live instruments. So um, it, we haven't ever made a record like that before, but um, we'll see. It, it seems like it's working out. But yeah, the record I have coming out in January is with uh, an amazing musician, you know, um, from Wisconsin, actually. You're in Wisconsin, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm in Madison. Yeah, yeah. yeah he's up in Wisconsin, um, John Mueller, and he does really, really beautiful um, meditative, I don't know how he would describe it, but I think of his work as very meditative and um, um, it, it kind of like trance-like almost. Okay. And um, we, we've, uh, he's played down in Bloomington, Illinois a couple times. Last time he played here, I, I used to, I used to host a, a series for like two and a half years, a monthly series of improvised and experimental music at a local underground place, DIY really? space. Yeah, yeah. And he came through and did that. And I recorded the the uh, his concert. He, he told me I could record it. And then I used the recording of his concert to make a whole new composition out of his 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 live performance was the foundation for this this much more elaborate composition. And on that, I'm playing saxophone, clarinet, bass clarinet, marimba, xylophone, um, bass doing some vocals where there's a the, lot of stuff on it where are you recording this at ha, well so i record i don't ever use a studio because i don't have any money um <laughs> <laughs> i hear you <ya. laughs> yeah so you know i can like record the the reeds in my bedroom you know because like okay. i have bass clarinet and a clarinet and an alto saxophone and stuff but then the like the marimba the all, that's what i was gonna say when you named off all those instruments i'm like where the hell are you keeping these things yeah, well <laughs> i i uh i often go back i work at a high school and there's a big <sighs> music room at the high school so on a sunday night when i know no one is there at mm -hmm. like 9 p.m i'll go into the 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 band room and i'll just like set up microphones and just go wild and use all the band equipment and the band director kind of knows <laughs> <laughs> he's like i know nothing i i didn't yeah, you were I'm never like, here <laughs> yeah do you mind if i come and he's like well we have jazz band rehearsal this night we have blah, blah, blah. and i was like what are, what are you gonna be here on a sunday he's like no i'm not gonna be here i'm like okay mm -hmm. so uh, i've actually done a lot of recording at the high school and they it's just it's one of the you know I just, I, you know, it's like, I don't make that much money. So this is one of the perks. <laughs> oh yeah. No, that's brilliant. And I'm super jealous. It's yeah. uh, right when you said that, I'm like, duh, you work at a school. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. And my key opens the band room. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Oh man. Okay. So now with these two different musicians, you told me how you met uh, uh, the guy with the album, uh, Mueller, who you yeah. are putting an album out with soon. Now, yeah, that comes out on FPE Records January 19th. Tell me about FPE Records. What's that? That was started by a friend of mine, Matt Pakulski, who I met years ago. Okay. Um, with When I was touring with Kid Static, um, we did a tour with a band called The Meishi, which is this fantastic... That sounds familiar. Kind of, yeah, you, you probably heard of them. They're kind of like a poppy punk like band from LA. Okay. Um, we did a tour with them and we played, we came through Boston and we stayed at this guy's house. Um, that's the type, you know, you know how it is. It's like, mm -hmm. we weren't staying in hotels. Whenever we would tour, we would just sleep on whatever floor we could get, you know? Yeah. And so um, we stayed at this guy's house, Doug DeMay and Doug happened to be, he, first of all, he has like this, amazing, I don't know if he still lives there. This was years ago. Okay. He had this house in like Cambridge, Massachusetts that had like a, synthesizer room like a like a movie room okay play, yeah super Nintendo bomber man on like a movie theater screen um he's like the sweetest human being i've ever met in my life well he's tied okay. i've met a lot of of the sweetest human beings he's tied for being one of the sweetest human beings i've ever met in my life and he's a <laughs> lawyer and he also is in this band called fat day so like his real love was like his record label and his punk band uh, but he made all his money as like a intellectual property rights lawyer or something. I don't remember. Don't quote me on that. <laughs> okay. So, something absurd. And um, and uh, so anyway, we stayed at his house. And then I that's how I heard about Fat Day. And Matt Pukulski was the singer in Fat Day. So then Matt had moved to Chicago. 
And then when I got back to Chicago, Yay Big Kid Static played a show. I can't remember what the venue was. And Matt Pukowski, from the singer from Fat Day, who was friends with Doug in Boston, came to the show to, to see. I think we were playing with the Meishi guys in Chicago, if I remember okay. correctly. And he came to see them. He didn't. I don't think he came to see us. Um, but then we hit it off and we, you know, we were like, oh, this is rad. Oh, you know, Doug. Yeah. Blah, 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 you know, that type of thing. So and then basically we didn't keep in touch <laughs> for years hmm. and then um i think it was in 2020 i made a record as yay big and i was in at the time a band called disorganizer and that was kind of like a post jazz post punk band um like we were equally influenced by uh, like fugazi as we were like um you know like ornette coleman or something so like we were okay. just, it, people thought of us in town as like a jazz group but you know, like our little secret was we weren't really like trying to be a jazz group. Right. <laughs> we were like, trying to play like punk shows and stuff. Um, but you, if you have a saxophone, I was playing electric mandolin in that band, not reeds. Um, okay. Uh, we had a tenor sax player in that band. So everybody, if you have a saxophone player, everybody thinks you're a jazz band. Um, it's true. No, we have a, we have a baritone sax. Actually, we have a sax player that plays multi instruments. But then after a while, uh, I just told him we're only ever going to write parts for your baritone saxophone. So you don't need to bring your other instruments <laughs> because it's the coolest. It is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so I put out, I've made this record as yay big and disorganizer. Cause I, I wanted to make a disorganizer record that I produced. I just wanted to like very selfishly produce a disorganizer record. I don't even think to be honest that uh, like two of the guys in disorganizer ended up really even liking the record. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Cause it's kind of weird. It's like one long 30 minute piece that moved through these movements. And it was all based off of improvising to these wind chimes that were hanging on my back deck. All right. It wasn't really the type of stuff this organizer did, but it also, was, by the way, I love that concept. It was, it was improvised oh. off of the wind chimes. That's fantastic. Wind chimes, yeah. I just sent, I sent like 12 people a 50 minute recording of wind chimes and just said, improvise to this. And they sent their parts <laughs> back to me. Yes. Yeah. And then I just put them all together and it ended up being three different records. But um, so so this one I did with Disorganizer, I, I wanted it to to reach a wider audience than what I was doing at the time. So I sent it to um, Matt at FPE, which stands for for practically everyone. He likes to think, you know, we, we're, on a, we're on the same wavelength. Like we, we feel like we can make whatever kind of music we want and we're making music that's for everybody. It's not it's not just for like this or that crowd or whatever. Um, so I love his label because it's it's a really diverse label but so anyway i sent it to matt and um he right away just resonated with it and and now i've put out i think the mueller record is going to be my fourth release on fpe okay. in in two years or two and a half years all right yeah but i'm i'm like obsessively i don't i don't like the word prolific because it's like people don't talk about breathing as like i i breathe prolifically that sounds stupid to say you know but like <laughs> yes. So for me to think that like I make music prolifically, that sounds as as dumb to me because I just like make it like I'm breathing. Mm -hmm. I'm always I'm working on like five records right now. I just can't. It's not. Um, it's just it's not something I think. It's not something I think about doing. It's okay. just I'm just always doing it. And Are so of, well, when you make these albums and you're you're continuing to make them and working on several at a time. Are they mm -hmm. all connected to labels somehow, or are you doing most of it self, just self-production or uh, self-release, or how are how are you putting those out? Well, everything I just start on my own, basically, or with the people I'm collaborating with, yeah. and then in the end, I'm trying to find people to put stuff out. But really, FPE Records is is Matt is the only person that's really been putting my stuff out for for the past couple of years. Before that, I was working with in Chicago with Yabe Kid Static with a with a really cool um label jib door that was an offshoot of locust records in chicago okay and then um this 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 guy uh sean um who ran i think he's oh no they're still active actually metal postcard hmm. put out some of my records um that guy is that guy's intense he's really awesome and he puts out so much stuff um are these and, net labels or are they uh, i guess what kind of label would they be categorized well, as jib well, Jib Door was doing physical releases with me. Oh, this was, okay. This was before all the streaming stuff. Okay. And then Metal Postcard has done both. They did a lot of vinyl back in the day, but it's so expensive. They're mostly doing digital releases now, as far as I know. Um, I did. I put out a record on Illegal Art back in the day, um, which is like all sample-based 
the concept of illegal art is that it's basically everything they release is technically illegal according to U.S. copyright law. Um, <laughs> it's all sample illegally sampled. Nice. I put out a record with them, um, 2012 ish or so, and that was digital but with a zine i made a zine that you could buy yeah i want to ask you about that in a sec too i saw that on the album that i found out about you from there was a weird zine, yeah a thing that you ran into trying to release it on bandcamp but with so you're saying those labels that you were talking about um most of them what they would do is they would create physical releases for you back in the day yeah but harder and harder to do that like with with for example with fpe i i make too much stuff so and he's already <laughs> oh no <laughs> yeah. he's, he's already in the hole like with me because okay. i you know he put out the the first cd that he the, the yay big disorganizer cd i don't think it ever recouped its costs okay. and then and then he put out a digital release and then he put out another one and now he's putting out another one and i keep telling him like hey I don't want you to spend money on this, but he's like, no, I want to pay for it to get mastered by somebody who's better than you. Basically, like he, like I mix and master everything myself, but he wants to get somebody who can do it better. So, yeah. which is fine, I understand. Right. So, um, so he's paying for the mastering and everything. So then, but really, that just puts me further in the hole, and I feel bad because I'm not making him any money, and he's doing all this work to try to get my stuff out there. But that's that's the way it is. Right. Um, uh, I think every label I've worked with is just because they're really cool people and they appreciate we appreciate each other mm-hmm. nobody has ever made a dime off of me as far as i know and i've never made any money <laughs> nobody wants to buy be a musician music. kids <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and run a record label it's yeah. really possible. um and then recently i started a record label speaking of making dumb decisions okay um, i started a record label with some of my comrades in bloomington normal illinois called No Below Editions. And everything we're gonna put out is gonna be physical and digital, but the physical runs are gonna be split into like these really um, niche uh, handcrafted artist editions. And, and then- When you say physical, what type of physical are you talking about? Our first release, which was, is a, uh, an album by Swim Ignorant Fire is on cassette. Okay. But the, but the artist edition is, um, we have like we're not just like music people. Two of the people who founded the label are visual artists, right? Um, by trade, uh, and um, print print. One of them's a printmaker, and um, mm. the other one's kind of he's like. They're, well, they're all like jack of all trades. They don't just do one thing. But um, so you're going to be making these physical releases in house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and even the process of of printing the cassette tapes, you're saying, or are you going to well be- the the cassettes we had we had uh dubbed i can't remember the company that did the dub okay, but then fine. but then they we did like our own printing on the cassette right and um the uh the packaging is really elaborate the mm. this the artist edition comes in this like homemade box that when you open it this like accordion style print comes out and oh nice they're all hand numbered there's only 50 of them no there's less than that there was only I can't remember how many the edition was, okay. but then there's like the, the proletariat edition too, which is like a regular cassette, you know, for people who can't afford the artist edition. That was just like 10 bucks. Um, and then our second release on Noblo editions is a record I'm putting out with Shane Parrish, who's this phenomenal guitarist who is based out of Georgia now. And um, he just, he tours with like Bill Orcutt. And um, I mean, he's like phenomenal and he's slumming it, making a record with me. Um, but <laughs> nice. We're putting out a CD together on No Blow Edition. Damn, you really so, are putting out music all the time. Jeez. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just put out a record with Nonlinear Field that we manufactured ourselves. Okay. Like a month ago. But yeah, the album with Shane Parrish is is called uh, Rocks and Water Folded Up. And in the artist edition, it's going to come with a piece of slate stone that has carved into it a, a line that, and it says fold here. And um, it's like conceptual, it's like, you know. Okay. Uh, yeah, and then the, there's this really elaborate packaging that's made out of recycled vinyl cases. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. And all of them are hand screen printed and everything. And so hopefully those artist editions sell out because then that'll pay for the next release. How did you find yeah. the recycled vinyl? How are you getting that? Oh, well, a good friend of mine runs a record store down the street. Okay. And, you know. Yeah, every once in a while he'll, he'll put out a bin and he's like, "These I can't sell these. People can just come and take these." 
And so it's just a bin of old records. And so we just snatch them up and recycle the cases. Oh, you're rec- oh, this cases. I was thinking you were making it out of the vinyl. Like somehow you were oh. grinding it up to actually make it into paper. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute. Cool. Okay. That, that would be cool. cool. Okay. That's why I was asking. I was like, how does that work? But no, no, okay. no. We're using the, yeah, the, the, gotcha. the big cases. Yeah, yeah. But I do, I do take a lot of his old records and use them. I, I lead a, um, an experimental music ensemble at the high school I work at. Yeah, you just the, had a show yesterday. Yeah, yeah. One of the young people in that band plays a record player. And so we have all these old records that nobody wants to listen to that he does. He's not like a DJ, you know, he's not like scratching or whatever. He's using them to create soundscapes. Nice. So I am recycling old records that nobody wants to just to create layers of sound. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, for, behind me here, this entire wall, these are all things that I sell online. I go to estate sales and find old stuff and then sell them online to people. And ah. so I do, I'm a reseller. So That's <laughs> I cool. know about finding things and reusing them for yeah. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and so you started this label. Why did you start this label? You've, you've already got so much going on and you're like, you know what? Let's make a label yeah. where we start printing all this stuff. Although it sounds fun as heck. So that's why I can understand that you would do it, but still it's really something a lot to yeah. take on. So it's, it's funny. It's like not actually fun for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love the people that I'm doing it with okay. like family. I love them dearly and I love making music. I don't love doing record label stuff at all, but, um, uh, but it helps put it out, right? I mean, the yeah. releasing more than just your own stuff, it brings yeah. in more people to follow a label rather than follow a group, I suppose, right? That's the that's the goal. We've we we we're only we're working really slow. We only have one record out. We're working on the second one now, which is the the Yay Big Shane Pierce. And how long's it been? How long's it been together? It's been. A year, less than oh, a year. Well, yeah, you, that's yeah. you're doing fine. Plus then. The process, the process is so slow because everything is so meticulously handmade, okay. and we all have full time jobs and families, and so, and we're not in any hurry. It's not like we're like, oh, we need to make this a career. None of us are looking at this as a career. Okay. The reason we started it is because there's a cool scene here in Bloomington Normal, and um, like of of sort of like experimental. Wait, did you say Bloomington Normal? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it's, that what it's, it's officially called? I thought it was just Bloomington, but it's Bloomington Normal. Bloom, well, Bloomington and Normal like are right next. Oh, to Oh, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Bloomington, Illinois. I'm not not Indiana. Bloomington, Illinois. Right. Yeah. Some people confuse us for Bloomington, Indiana, because that's where the you know secret, secretly Canadian is and whatever. I think is that what they're called? Secretly Canadian. Anyway, they're <laughs> they're they're known to have a much hipper music scene than Bloomington, Illinois. Okay. But, but yeah, Bloomington Normal Normal. Uh, is actually the uh, the town I teach in, Normal Community High School. But I live in Bloomington. But there are might they're just one. Big it sounds community. like some sort of David Lynchian uh, sitcom that he would make. Like you know, you, you live in the town of Normal, but it's not. You know, it's actually yeah. very odd. <laughs> there's a there's a Ben Fold song where he name drops it. Oh, he, he like drove through on tour once and then wrote a song um, that he talks about Normal Illinois. Interesting. Um, yeah. Um, but uh so you were talking about the music scene there and uh, oh yeah 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 okay so there's a pretty <laughs> vibrant you know improvised experimental music scene here and like i said i was doing these like monthly shows bringing in people from out of town yeah. and do, you know helping the scene grow here and then my friend eddie brightweiser has a nonprofit that focuses on experimental music really he hosts, yeah he hosts a series of shows in town here and is pretty good about like grant writing to actually bring through touring acts that um, need how, to get paid. How um, does he do so, a nonprofit for that? That's curious to me. He's just, I don't know. That's just, I, I don't know. He, I feel like he can never get any money for music unless it's involved with a high school of some sort. I think he's good at writing grants. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Grant proposals. I don't, I don't, I'm not, that's not my skill set. Gotcha. And, okay. Um, Yo, know, so we're a good pair because he actually helped me craft a grant to get my high school ensemble a bunch of equipment a couple of years ago oh nice he's the reason that we have like a pa system and some synthesizers and some recording equipment because he was just like you should write a grant blah blah, blah. and i was like oh, i don't want to do that he's like no so he like basically wrote the whole thing for me and now we got all this equipment that's but, super um, cool 
Yeah. So, so him and me, and then, you know, there's a handful of other people too, that are working really hard to try to do a lot of cool stuff here. And we thought, well, you know, we should start to try to document some of these things ourselves mm -hmm. instead of relying on other record labels. So that's how the idea came about really. Okay. And it's not that any of us want needed something else to do. It's just like, we felt compelled to do it. And like I said, I love all of the people that I'm doing that label, no below editions I'm, that I'm doing it with. So it's always a pleasure to get together. It doesn't feel like, you know, sometimes when you go to meetings, you kind of like dread it, you know, mm -hmm. when we, when we get together, it's always fun. We just, you know, we're hanging out, we're talking about music and we're talking about um, how to, how to put stuff out into the world. So yeah, it's cool. And the art, the visual art is amazing. We did a short little tour over the last summer um, with three of the artists that are helping run the label. And that was fun. I hadn't toured in years. I only did like four dates. They did it. They did. They did more. I only joined for like half of it, hmm. but wow, yes, yeah, so I didn't really tour that much. But. Okay. And one thing I wanted to bring up too, uh, with the type of music and things that you're doing in labels and all that kind of stuff. So the way I discovered you is I have a music show that I do where I, I just put out different types of artists. One, it's music that was, uh, that inspired songs that we've made. Like when, when we write a song, I start creating a playlist when I hear stuff where I'm like, Oh, I like the way that this sounds or I like the way they made a transition there or whatever in songs. And I'll, I'll just add it to a playlist that I uh, like a secret playlist that I make on YouTube. And by the end I have like maybe 15 songs that are kind of a weird little mix of music, but they all really connect with the song that we release. Mm -hmm. And then another show that I do is because we're a creative commons band and I go out and look for other creative commons artists and I try to find more creative commons musicians and your song was actually a Creative Commons song, and you actually release a lot of your stuff under Creative Commons. So I wanted yeah. to ask you uh, about why you do that, because I don't, I I know back when downloading was a bad thing before they were streaming, and people like don't worry about downloading music anymore. Uh, creative Commons was like a huge deal, and going, hey, yes, you can download our stuff, and we're not going to come after you, and you can use it and things. Now mm -hmm. it's kind of like, it's kind of hard to find Creative Commons musicians because everybody just goes, I put it on Spotify or I put it on Apple and people can just listen to it. You know, there's no, people don't have to secretly download it. So why did you start releasing under Creative Commons? Well, um, this gets into another, you know, I talked I, earlier, I said I was a practicing Buddhist. That's mm -hmm. one part of me. Another part of me is anarchism. I'm really <laughs> nice. Uh, <laughs> I really think we need to live in a world that the, the, the closest sort of political, political economic philosophy that I would associate with is anarchism, like a, a world beyond capitalism without the state, without, now I don't mean like we should do that now. If we got rid of the state now, we'd have nobody to protect us from, from like, you know, Pfizer or whatever, but, um, right. Um, but in the, in the long term ideal, I think, we can do better. We can live more sustainably and more peacefully. I'm also a pacifist religiously. That's another part of my identity um, that I'm really, uh, that actually pacifism is what led me to anarchism. But all this is to say my views on property are very informed by pacifist anarchism. I don't okay. think, I don't think private property is legitimate, whether it's, whether it's property in the form of land or whether it's property in the form of intellectual property. I don't think that anybody has a rightful claim to say this thing belongs to just me or to this group of people. Like every, everything that's created is a product of accumulation or a product of, uh, you know, um, what, what's the Marxist phrase for this? It would, uh, I can't remember the, the exact phrase, but it's, 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 uh, th there are no purely original creations. Um, mm -hmm. I think, so to claim that you came up with an idea and that that idea is now your property, I think is is a illegitimate position to hold. And so um, now that's separate from like taking a piece of art somebody made and not doing anything to it, just taking that and reselling it. I think that is unethical. But mm -hmm. like if I make a piece of art and you take some of it and you remake it into something else, and build you upon have it, yeah. Yeah, you should have every right to do that because that's how everything is created. Right. That's how any idea uh, 
comes about. Nobody has an original idea. They're all an accumulation of all of the ideas and all of the culture and all of the language and all of the socially constructed realities that have preceded the thought that I had just now. Mm -hmm. And so it's for me to like put that thought in a box and say, that's my thought. I own it. And you, you don't have access to it. I, I don't agree with that. So, you know, when I discovered that creative commons was a uh, you know, like a movement of artists who are like, hey, we want to share our stuff. You can build upon this. You can take pieces of this and make something new. That just seemed like a natural thing to put next to my releases. You know, I was like, oh, that's an option. Yeah, yeah. of course. I'll. Yeah. And did so, you discover that on Bandcamp or did, had you heard about it previously? Like, how did you how did you first no, hear about yeah, it? I was acquainted with that before Bandcamp. Okay. Um, I was working with that label Illegal Art for a few years before I even released anything with them, I kind of like helped run that label under an alias. Like the people who ran that label did it all under fake names because you know, what we were doing was illegal, but, um, and we didn't want to, if we got sued, we didn't want anybody to find us, you know? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, I didn't start the label. A good friend of mine started it and, um, he, he just very graciously allowed me to help him run the label for a few years. But anyway, so he kind of was the guy that schooled me to Creative Commons years before, um, years before I Bandcamp was a thing. You know, okay, um, yeah. He he's he's been one of my creative gurus in my life. Um, yeah, he ran that label under the name Philo T. Farnsworth. If you oh, ever look that. up illegal. Yeah, that's I think that's the name of the guy that invented the TV. I think that's where he stole that name from. <laughs> I could see that. All right, I, I'm not. It's not ringing any bells in my head, but I just it's it sounds fun to say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it is. I don't think fun Yeah. Oh, and also, I I meant to ask you this earlier. So the name, uh, yay big. It, mm -hmm. So clearly, before you before I actually met with you, I thought it was yeah big. So why is it yay big, and how did you come up with that name? Uh, it's like a vague unit of measurement. I don't know if it's a regional thing where I am from, okay. or if it's more widespread. But oh. it's like yeah, it's about yay big. Yeah, <laughs> it's like I thought you were. So when you told me that before we started, I thought you literally meant like it's a it's. A real unit of measurement, but no, you mean a Midwestern <laughs> yeah. unit of measurement. Yeah, it's like a colloquialism, you know. It's like, <laughs> how big was it? I don't know about yay big. <laughs> it's like that. I'm so um, glad I asked that now. That's yeah, awesome. but so th that name came about because I never wanted even you know. Okay, so I started making my own home recordings and releasing records when I was like a kid. You know, I had like a four track recorder in the you know the mid 90s early 90s and i was making these tapes and then when i got a computer i started making cds and giving them to my friends and stuff and um i never wanted to be locked down into like like i was in a bluegrass band for a while years ago wow. years ago all right like a, like a bluegrass fusion band or whatever i don't know um and i studied indian classical music with a teacher in the suburbs of chicago for a while i've done the hip-hop thing i've i've been in like jam bands you know back when i had when i was like a teenager with dreadlocks you know um and i never wanted to be pigeonholed into like a bluegrass mandolinist or a hip-hop producer or mm -hmm. you know whatever and so i liked the idea of the vague measurement you know like my music is an approximation it's a vague approximation of things it's not ever the thing itself and so it's like well what what kind of music do you make i'm like i don't know it's about yay big <laughs> that's still gonna get me every time i can't believe i never noticed that oh man <laughs> what do you that's where the name came from yeah. what uh what do you use to, or how do you record what are you recording wait i'm wording this wrong what software do you use to track your stuff mm -hmm. i use ableton live which okay. is what i've used for years but i really don't know what i'm doing and <laughs> i <laughs> i don't actually have any interest in software or gear or like i don't have i don't use plugins i like don't know how to use them okay you know like somebody would be like what plugins are you using to do your whatever i'm like i just use whatever is in the thing yeah and um i i i'm just not interested in it um and ableton I have my own sort of niche way of using it. I, you know, you can like toggle between different screens. There's the mixer looking screen. And then there's the, like the track looking screen. Yeah. And I, 
I don't ever use the other screen where you can like put things in it and do live right. performances with. The, I don't the even screen with the buses. Screen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been using Ableton Live since like two thousand and seven, and I don't know how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Yet I you just, continuously put out albums on it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I like record in it, and then I use it to mix, and then. If I'm mastering stuff, I'll like ex I'll like do whatever I can in Ableton and then export it to like uh what's it called? Um Audacity, mm -hmm. which is like this free software. Yep. To do, you know, if I need to do hard limiting or something like that, because right. I don't know how to do that in Ableton. I'm sure I could do it in Ableton. I just don't know how. Yeah. Um no, I do so quick I I do quick and dirty mastering in Audacity all the time where you just export it from the the DAW you're using then put it in audacity. Yeah. And then you create a limiter so that it has a flat thing, normalize it and then add compression and then boom, exactly. suddenly it's maximized, you know? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, I, I'm just like, nah, I don't know, man. I'm like, I told you at the beginning, I look like the kind of guy that would be tech savvy. You know, <laughs> I have like tattoos and, you know, wear a hat and have weird, you know, well, I mean, not weird, but like black glasses and right. whatever. Um, I just you look not, like somehow you're hacking into my computer right now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm more interested in like philosophy and um you know uh, metacognitive revolution than I am in like people asking me about gear. Not and I'm not criticizing you for asking me about the software, just like when people <laughs> like when people come I up didn't to me. I take it that show, way until now. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, I remember playing with disorganizer, my old band, you know, um and I would use, I would have like a compressor and a distortion pedal or whatever with mm -hmm. the electric mandolin. And sometimes people would come, want to come up to me afterwards and ask me about the electric mandolin and the pedals I was using and the amp I was using. And I would always just say, I don't know, man. Yeah. I don't know. This, I, I would sometimes lie and be like, I don't know. The pedals belong to the bassist. You should talk to him. Yeah. No, I, um, I don't think I've owned my own piece of equipment uh, since I started out. I, I mean, because I was the singer, but now I play other instruments. And it's like, th the whole process is, I'm like, well, maybe I could play piano. I remember I took a piano lesson when I was 10. And then I just started playing. I didn't know how to play, yeah. but yet we did music with it. You learn as you go. You learn from doing yeah. it, you know. And then as you exactly. go along, you're like, oh, that's what this thing I've been using does. But it right, made music. Right. You plug it in, stuff comes out, and you record it. Yeah. <laughs> That's making I music. Have, I have friends and family who are super talented at recording and engineering, and they know what they're doing, and they, like, study it, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I have, a, you know, a really, really close family member who does it professionally for a living, you know, and has a great career. And... um. I very probably easily could have worked my familial ties with him to be like, Hey, let me get some of this work with you, whatever. But I just like suck at it and have no interest <laughs> in getting better at it. I, you know, I know enough about making stuff to make what I want to make. And, yeah. and if I'm making something, I, and like I record a gong or something, I'm like, I can't get this gong to, to sound right then I have to learn how to use an equalizer better. So then at that point, I might go online and look up a tutorial about how to use an equalizer in Adobe, or not Adobe, in um, Ableton. Ableton. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that I can get the certain resonance or like there's some pitch in the gong that's making everything muddy so I can get that. But, but at the end of the recording, I don't really retain it. <laughs> So, when I do another recording with like the same instrument, I'm like, what? Did I, I don't know how to do this again. Um, I have to like start over every time because I'm like a recording goldfish. I don't remember how to do anything. Same. <laughs> well, I want to thank you so much for talking with me today. This has been a lot of fun. And uh, where should people go check out your stuff if they want to listen to it? Probably the easiest way to find the whole cat. Well, almost the whole catalog is just yaybig.bandcamp. It's Y-E-A-B-I-G.bandcamp. I think I have close to 50 releases on there. So people yeah, you can- you got like, a good amount of stuff on there. They can explore, yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much for talking with me, Dave. Thank you, man. This is fun. I just said thank you so much for talking with me. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks so much. Cool. See ya. Thank you. <laughs>